you for, t I will share my screen for a moment here. So um, I'm always gaveling out the uh, meeting at the end. And so John decided to um, get me a, an official Ivan Gavel. And so I happened to be in an airport at the moment and I didn't really want to bring the gavel through security. So here is a picture of it, but it will be used in future meetings. <laughs> and so anyway, um, with, yeah. with that introduction, I think I'll turn things over to John to welcome us all. Well, Dave, it looks like uh, you're going to be well equipped to uh, maintain order and uh, decorum throughout these meetings. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not, not that we've had any uprisings or anything of that nature uh, as of yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop laughing in just a minute. Good, good, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, yet another uh, Ivan Zoom meeting. This is uh, number 21 uh, since uh, a year ago, uh, March of 2000. Well, I think April 2020, uh, we uh, started the uh, online Zoom meetings. I've uh, got uh, a very good... Uh, uh, lineup of uh, speakers today. Uh, great uh, subject material, uh, as always, uh, uh, dare I say. Uh, got a very good number of uh, participants. I, I'm seeing uh, well over 100 and uh, certainly glad that uh, uh, everyone can uh, join us on this uh, wonderful uh, uh, summer day. Uh, MR Resources and uh, Q1 Instruments are very, very happy with the uh, continuing sponsorship uh, of the Ivan Group. Uh, in fact, we're certainly looking forward to uh, uh, ENC uh, coming up uh, next year, uh, looking a little bit further out in the future, but uh, going to have some uh, 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 great events uh, uh, coming up. Uh, so MR Resources in Q1, very, very happy to uh, sponsor. MR Resources, of course, has uh, been around for 35 years, providing uh, repair services, quench recovery services, uh, relocation, uh, also providing uh, uh, reconditioned NMR spectrometers. And please keep in mind, they're uh, also uh, very eager to uh, uh, purchase any uh, late model uh, unused uh, or uh, surplus uh, NMR systems. Uh, please contact them uh, uh, if you would. Uh, also, uh, Q1, uh, uh, Don is not with us today, uh, off on vacation, uh, uh, fishing perhaps. But I think, uh, Eric, you have a, a brief uh, uh, video uh, to update us just a bit on uh, Q1. Uh, if you could uh, show that to us, please. We invite you to get to know Q1. Q1 designs and manufactures NMR spectrometers from 400 to 600 megahertz with features for routine use and the research laboratory. Want to upgrade an older system without blowing your budget? Q1 can retrofit AS and Ultra Shield magnets with complete upgrades, including automation, for less than you think. Q1 offers NMR instruments with excellent performance at an unbeatable price. Experts know the key to performance is the probe, and Q1 offers smart tune and match probes made by Q1 Tech. Q1 Tech has decades of experience and leads the market in innovation. Q1 STM probes have a patented hybrid tuning mechanism, which means faster tuning for improved th throughput and unmatched reliability. Q1 offers their 400 megahertz instrument with STM probes in three configurations. A two channel probe with fluorine tuning on both X and H channels for maximum flexibility. Or fluorine detection can be isolated to the X or H channel to maximize H sensitivity or to maximize carbon and phosphorus sensitivity. Q1 Tech STM probes are also integrated into Topspin and VNMRJ for improved performance and throughput for existing installations. Want to know more? Our websites have additional info. We're also happy to provide remote demonstrations with your samples. Please contact us by phone or email. And uh... Krish, to you, uh, could you give us an update on uh, uh, upcoming uh, meetings, please? Uh, yes, thank you, John. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, the, I just want to announce what is coming down the pike in this uh, research topics uh, workshops. Uh, the next meeting 
um, is on September 23rd. That's a Thursday. Uh, the topic is applications of uh, natural abundance N15 NMR in structural sedation by, and it will be led by Gary Martin. And uh, Gary will be joined by four other panelists, uh, Mikhail uh, Raybark from Merck, uh, Kalindi Morgan from University of uh, North British Columbia, Ron Crouch, JOL USA, and Sang Ling Kwan from Amgen. Uh, look forward to um, seeing you again uh, next month. The, then we have uh, enough topics in the pipeline until February at this point. Um, some of the topics are F19 NMR in pharma, uh, reaction monitoring, uh, bench top, spectral fitting. Um, so uh, hopefully we will fill some more um, as the days come in. And uh, the subjects would be are in our website, Ivan website. You can take a look at that. Uh, right now, the exact dates are still being worked out, uh, but they are typically the third week or third Thursday of the month. Um, we have October, November. They're taking a break in December, January, and February. And so uh, looking forward to seeing you again. Uh, with that, I will pass it back to uh, John to continue this. Um, Th thank you, Krish. And uh, as always, uh, fantastic to see a, a continuing program, uh, uh, very informative uh, subject matter, and uh, certainly uh, uh, very, very good, interesting, and talented uh, uh, speakers that uh, we've got uh, lined up. So now at this point, uh, we'll uh, pass things over to uh, Dave Rice, who is uh, broadcasting live from San Jose International <laughs> Airport. <laughs> <laughs> and and Dave, if uh, you would uh, get things started for us, please. Okay, well, uh, I guess uh, there's nothing more to say except to let me introduce our uh, panel leader, Brian Antelek, and he can take over at this point. I just want to thank the organizers, Chris, Dan, Dave, John, and Eric for the invitation. I'm very happy to uh, present on Diffusion NMR, and I'm pleased to have with me Gareth Morris from the University of Manchester and Jurgen Kols from Magritech. Um, today, I'm going to get things started by kind of a qualitative overview on some basic aspects of Diffusion NMR. Then, then I'm going to turn it over to Gareth, who will talk about some advanced methodology and explain things much better than I can. And then Jurgen will follow up with uh, benchtop applications. Um, we're gonna cover most of the chat questions at the very end in the Q&A session to kind of keep things moving along. So um, hopefully most of you will stay until the end and, and, and have that uh, discussion with us. So I'll get started. Um, I'll talk about diffusion. Um, molecules in solution undergo uh, Brownian motion and therefore translate in space. And this is a simulation of a, a particular, of a single particle uh, translating through a volume. I just took this from a YouTube video. It's undergoing random walk, and you might expect the particle just to kind of hover around one point, but that's not really what happens. It, it, it explores all reaches of the volume and can extend or translate in one dimension or all dimensions quite a bit, certainly given enough time. And if we consider the ensemble of molecules, so many, many molecules, the uh, distance it travels can be described by a probability function that's actually a Gaussian. So here we show the distance it travels on average um, in one dimension through a Gaussian. And, and the width of that Gaussian can be considered in two different ways. It can actually represent the same size particles moving around at a later time, or it can represent uh, an ensemble of sm smaller size particles moving at the same time. Um, 
the notion of NMR having the ability to measure this diffusion uh, came about with Erwin Hahn in, in 1950. And I, I have an excerpt from the late Sir Paul Callahan uh, that I've included, and I think it's a, a very good description. I'll just quickly um, read it out. In 1950, Erwin Hahn pointed out that spin echoes in NMR could be used to measure molecular translational motion, an effect made possible because nuclear spins carry a phase determined by the history of their residence in magnetic fields. If through our own volition or by consequence of sample structure, magnetic fields can be given some spatial variation, and if the spin bearing molecules translate, then the spin phases can be made to tell the story of that migration. So essentially we need two different things. We need the ability to refocus magnetization given to us by the spin echo. And we need a variation in the magnetic field. Um, and, and from that, we can actually measure diffusion. And it wasn't until the mid sixties that Stasekel and Tanner uh, devised a method using pulsed gradients um, that made the experiment actually very useful. So from here it took off and um, as um, magnet technology and probe technology improved, people started using this more and more. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, Peter Stilbs was credited as the first to, to formally introduce this method for mixture analysis. That led to the famous Dozy experiment in the early 90s by uh, Charles Johnson, where uh, a pseudo 2D plot of diffusion versus chemical shift was introduced. Um, I mentioned Q-space formalism by Callahan that's important in imaging and porosity. And, and, and from the mid nineties on, there's been a bouquet of advances, too many to list, but I do point out the work at uh, University of Manchester um, uh, under Gareth, uh, where there's been tremendous development in pulse sequences and data processing um, that's been incredibly broadly applicable and, and extremely useful. So I'm gonna to touch upon some of their work as I, as I move along. Uh, plenty of reviews out there. I highlight a recent one that's excellent. I just read it. And if you're new to this area, you might as well start there. Um, so getting back to diffusion and a moving particle, uh, if you consider again the ensemble, the average distance that that particle will travel during a period of time, T, um, is given by the uh, root mean square uh, um, distance. And that is dependent on a, an, on a constant called the diffusion coefficient. That diffusion coefficient is specific for a particular sized molecule and viscosity and temperature. Uh, if we put those molecules in our magnetic or in our uh, spectrometer, we're going to impose upon them a constant magnetic field. So anywhere in that volume, the molecules experience the same magnetic field and therefore have the same frequency. However, if on top of that, we impose a varied magnetic field, a gradient, then the spins will experience a position dependent um, magnetic field and therefore position dependent frequency in the direction of the change in the magnetic field. Um, if that variation is introduced via a gradient uh, having a certain strength, G, and certain time, little delta, then we can uh, impose upon it a well-defined position-dependent phase angle. And this is what we use in our pulse sequences to measure diffusion. 
And so this is the basic pulse sequence of spin echo with two gradients. And I'll just kind of quickly go through it uh, qualitatively. Uh, it has five different components, uh, excitation and, and acquire. Um, the first gradient is used to encode that, that phase information, that position dependent phase um, um, phase angle. And then we wait a period of time, big delta. Uh, and in the middle of that period, we have a refocusing step. And then we apply the gradient again to bring back the position dependent phase angle. And if, if I can just kind of show that um, qualitatively, um, the position phase angle can be um, looked at this way. So, so the, the gradient adds to that phase angle. And then we have the inversion. And the second gradient brings it back to um, our acquisition. So we can, in principle, get back all of our signal. However, in that period of time, diffusion molecules uh, translate. And so they're located at a different point after that period of time. And therefore, we're not able to bring back that phase angle um, completely. Therefore, we lose signal. And that signal loss is going to be dependent on the gradient that we apply. So here's the basic experiment. We simply vary the gradient strength not the gradient time nor the, the, the diffusion time, time we allow for diffusion. We wanna keep the timing parameters the same in our pulse sequence. So we vary the gradient strength and the signal then decays over the course of the series of spectra. And that decay in signal is dependent upon the diffusion coefficient. So in this case, small molecules translate farther in distance than large molecules and therefore their signal cannot be um, uh, refocused as much as the large molecules. And this is dependent, or this is well known and dependent on the, the, the Stasekel-Tanner equation on um, the parameters of the gradient as well as the diffusion coefficient. So this is how we measure the, the diffusion coefficient. And from here, there is a wide range of applications uh, from mixture analysis to uh, porosity. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through large molecules and small molecules, and then talk a little bit about mixture analysis um, briefly. I do a a lot of work with polymers, and so I'm interested in polymer diffusion. So I'll point out a, a few things about polymers um, as I go along here. So if you measure the diffusion of polymers as a function of molecular weight, uh, you will find that they scale, they obey a power law, and it's well known, and that power law is valid as long as you are in the dilute regime. And if you look at this data, um, at the high molecular weight, that dilute um, condition is, is quite severe, 0 0.05 weight percent. So um, if, if you keep within the dilute regime, then you can well understand the system. So in this case, we're measuring diffusion with molecular weight, but we, we have to take into account solvent viscosity and temperature. So this is where we invoke the work of, of Einstein, who um, over a century ago developed the idea around diffusion and how it relates to, to uh, temperature in the medium. So, so basically there's a balance between thermal energy and uh, a frictional force. And if we obey the uh, Stokes law. So in other words, uh, we take some assumptions that 
we're examining solid particles in a continual medium. Uh, these particles aren't interacting and uh, we're under laminar flow, et cetera. Um, then we get a relationship like this in one dimension, which relates this, this frictional um, component with viscosity and the size of the particle. And uh, then we get our famous Stokes-Einstein relationship. So now we can relate the size to diffusion, making the assumptions of our, our polymer solution, and that is basically two assumptions, that it's dilute, that is the polymer chains are not interacting with one another over the course of the experiment. Or, or diffusion time, I should say, and that we're in a good solvent so that a random coil geometry or configuration is, is um, present, then we can relate the size to molecular weight. And this, this procedure is akin to GPC in their uh, polystyrene equivalent molecular weight or PMMA equivalent molecular weight. But just using this single relationship with, with PEO, uh, it works well for vinyl polymers, for um, polyurethanes, polyesters. Uh, it doesn't work for PDMS, but you have to use a different, uh, different scaling. The scaling exponent is the same, but, but you have to use a different constant and, and you, you, you can um, accurately measure molecular weight. So moving to small molecules, there's been some recent work um, to look at robust methods to relate diffusion coefficient with size and diffusion coefficient with, with molecular weight for small molecules. And the idea here is that uh, some of the assumptions that are made around the Stokes-Einstein equation are not accurate. Most molecules are not spherical, nor are they large with respect to solvent molecules. Um, so some empirical considerations have been brought in to make a robust relationship with as little uh, parameterization. And the, the nice thing is that this um, formalism, which was developed at um, Manchester uh, is, is nicely included in a practical tool that you can download. So all the work of, uh, the, uh, of, of defining the temperature dependent viscosity for many solvents, as well as the, 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 the um, math behind the calculations, you can now convert diffusion to size or molecular weight. This is very useful. In, in studying uh, chemistry of small molecules, sometimes um, you want to determine if something has dimerized, for example, so that this can be very practical. So, so now, um, if we move from the diffusion of single molecules to um, many molecules within a particular sample, we're getting into the area of mixture analysis. Um, so here we're interested in trying to pick apart a sample that is a mixture and uh, try to simplify it, try to break apart the components, understand if things reacted with one another, et cetera. So in order to do this properly, um, you have to consider several things, solution preparation, uh, concentration and solvent choice, uh, data acquisition, there's a number of pulse sequences that are available today um, and have a number of conditions that may be varied to optimize the acquisition. Uh, a number of choices of data processing that are important in, in the, the final goal of all of this uh, is to present the data to the people that need the data um, what's the best way? Is it a 2D plot or is it resolved components or, or what? So um, 
if we consider a simple system, sometimes just showing the spectra is enough. Maybe you show the last spectrum and, and show what, what the polymer spectrum looks like without all the solvents and impurities in there. Maybe that's enough, but sometimes uh, showing it in a 2D plot with diffusion versus chemical shift is, is important. There's a number of different ways to do this. Um, but then there's another way to present the data that is to resolve the components uh, as pure components or pseudo pure components based on their uh, diffusion coefficient. And so again, um, out of Manchester, there's a, a beautiful um, um, program called NAT that incorporates all of the main uh, processing methods um, for diffusion data. Um, it's very easy to use. Uh, I use it all the time. It's, it's free for download, uh, works great. Um, here's an example of a solution of glucose and sucrose. They are pretty close in size to one another, but you can show the separation of the two components, well, three components if you include water, um, very nicely in a 2D plot. Um, or you can resolve the components under some circumstances um, cleanly using another method, in this case called SCORE. Uh, you can see independently uh, the sucrose from the, from the glucose. Uh, maybe you want to do this if, if, if you're interested in looking at this, um, making assignments, for example, of a component or figuring out what it is. Um, there's some caveats uh, that you have to consider in using one versus another. As the diffusion coefficients get too close together, it gets more difficult to resolve pure components, for example. So I'm going to wrap it up a little bit and show a, 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 a real life example that I looked at a, a couple of years ago. We had a chemist that was interested in making a, a blocked copolymer of styrene and um, allele methacrylate. In this case, there was a, it was a two-step synthesis, make the first block of styrene, then grow the um, allele methacrylate onto it. We were interested in understanding what the heck we had at the end. And with diffusion, um, we discovered that we had polystyrene homopolymer, at least a fraction of the material that was made was polystyrene homopolymer. So, so some of the uh, initial block was inactive for one reason or another and, and wouldn't form a copolymer. And then the copolymer um, we discovered had a compositional variation as a function of molecular weight. So the allele methacrylate uh, versus the polystyrene, or at least the ratio varied as a function of molecular weight. And we were able to uh, compare that with the GPC um, in, in a complementary way. Um, and, and I just want to finish up quickly with, with a couple of, of, of quick thoughts here. Um, there are some common problems that one has to um, understand, uh, non-constant gradients, convection, uh, because of temperature gradients, that will always exist. Um, there's uh, ways around it uh, using um, physical means or, um, for example, smaller tubes or spinning. But to get around a lot of these common problems, um, uh, people have worked out um, strategies and elements of pulse sequences uh, that, that beautifully um, enable us to acquire um, extremely pure data. So um, I think that, oh, one more thing. Um, I just want to mention uh, in practice, you can sample the gradient or vary the gradient in different ways. You can vary it any way you want, um, in, in fact, but um, 
normally we vary it linearly, but you can also vary it in a quadratic way, um, which is actually necessary if you were to use the, the processing technique of DECRA. Uh, one way that I've found very useful is varying it in a, in a sigmoidal way because it accounts, it better accounts for low and high molecular weight in the same sample. And that, that can be used with DOZI or, or CORE or a number of different um, techniques. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to uh, Gareth to, to, to pick up. Okay, thanks very much, Brian. So the first application that Brian mentioned was mixture analysis. And this is both one of the most useful ways of using diffusion NMR, and uh, as I will try to explain, one of the most frustrating. So I'll talk about some uh, advanced methods that enable us to get the best out of using diffusion methods to analyze mixtures of small molecules. We'll see that the central problem here is that things fall apart when signals overlap. And we can either try to live with that and to use the most sophisticated data tools to get the best out of what data we can acquire, or we can try to avoid the problem altogether. We can try to bypass it by using more sophisticated acquisition methods. So let's see how we get on. Let me, let me go back to the basics, and uh, we all start with the idea of molecules diffusing. Here, rather than showing a single history of how a molecule diffuses, I'm just showing how a set of 100 molecules of three different sizes gradually diffuse over a wider and wider expanse of a fluid. If they do this in a field gradient, then their magnetizations will build up a history, which with a very large number of molecules will end up giving us a spread of phases, a Gaussian spread of phases. And the Gaussian is one of the most beautiful mathematical functions. The Gaussian spread of phases actually gives us a Gaussian spread, sorry, a Gaussian attenuation of the net signal. So what we do if we want to use POSC field gradient NMR to try to distinguish between species of different sizes is to measure our pulse field gradient stimulated or spin echo spectra as a function of gradient field strength. Importantly, we then take those experimental measurements and try to invert them to find what the diffusion coefficients are. And we do this by some sort of process of fitting. And this is the first gotcha. Name dozy is a great one for suckering people in. It implies a kinship with all these wonderful, dependable 2D NMR experiments cozy, nosy, rosy, and so on. But there is a fundamental difference here that in most multidimensional, and in what we might call true multidimensional NMR experiments, there is a Fourier transform relationship between conjugate dimensions, which is a fancy way of saying, if you see a chemical shift in a 2D experiment, that's the chemical shift. And the tragedy of Dozy is that when you see a diffusion coefficient in a dozy spectrum, if you're lucky, it's the chemical shift. If you're not, it ain't. Dozy spectra are statistical constructs. We do some sort of a fitting of experimental data, and we then use that to construct a spectrum in which we see an apparent distribution of signal as a function of diffusion strength that just reflects the uncertainty that our fitting method reports. But the position of those shapes, those Gaussian shapes, is dependent on the estimate of the diffusion coefficient. And hence, we'll always see some scatter, even when the experiment is working perfectly. And the sad thing, of course, is that it doesn't always work perfectly. So we take a set of spectra as a function of gradient. Here's linear sampling, though quadratic is a bit more common. Sigmoidal is gaining in uh, adherence now. 
and then we construct our dosage spectrum. And on a good day, we get beautiful separation. Uh, this is a very, very old spectrum of uh, a random set of molecules that happened to be on the fume hood and on Sunday morning. But it gave a very nice result, where if we project our experimental data onto the diffusion axis, we see a diffusion spectrum in inverted commas, which has four components and says, we've got four different species here. And if we were to take a cross section through the 2D spectrum, the 1D cross section would give us a separate spectrum for each component at each diffusion coefficient. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, the big difficulty is that the analysis with this beautiful high resolution assumes that we have a single component for each chemical shift. We assume that there is no overlap between signals. To go beyond that is exceptionally demanding of experimental data. So what can we do about this? Well, the basic problem is that where signals overlap, we need somehow to prize apart the different exponential contributions to the signal decay as a function of gradient squared. And statistically, that is an exceptionally challenging job. Whole review articles have been written about how this is a mare's nest, a really difficult job. So what we generally do in chemical applications of DOSI is to use just a mono-exponential fit. We say, okay, let's assume that we have just a single species, a single diffusion coefficient for each peak, and let's then do an analysis based on that, but always at the back of our mind, know that if we have overlapping peaks, we're going to get a misleading result. And nine times out of 10, the misleading result takes the form of an apparent diffusion coefficient, which is intermediate between the diffusion coefficients of the two species involved. So we've taken the simple case here where we have a, a strong doublet, which diffuses slowly, and a weaker doublet, which diffuses more rapidly. Where the peaks are fully resolved, we get the correct diffusion coefficients. Where they overlap partly, then we get some sort of a compromise. Now, the obvious thing to do here is just to say, well, yeah, but that's not mono-exponential, it's bi-exponential. So let's do a bi-exponential fit. And again, on a good day, we can get very nice separation. And uh, Brian showed an example here, glucose and sucrose. What we're doing here is saying, well, for each point on this shape, we're going to do a bi-exponential fit. We're going to find how much of each of two different diffusion coefficients we've got. And the result then is that we can effectively disentangle the two contributions. Now the snag is that this is exceptionally demanding of the signal to noise ratio and of the absence of systematic errors from the experimental data. On the other hand, as Brian's mentioned, there is another way to go, which is to use more sophisticated statistics and we can do a multivariate analysis where we say, well, we have our signal here, which is varying as a function of chemical shift and of diffusion coefficient. So let's impose a model. Let's say, suppose we have just two species here. What does that tell us? And the only way that you can get a perfect fit of such data in this case, is with two species which have these spectra and those diffusion coefficients. So these are just complementary ways of applying the same simplifying assumption, the same model to our experimental data. We say we've got two species, do we can do a bi-exponential bi fit, or we can do a multi-way analysis. This one used SCORE, but there are many other methods, and DECRA is particularly simple and elegant one. So we have a big problem, which is that although the name DOZI promises a lot, it doesn't actually always deliver. Nevertheless, 
the spectroscopist or the spectroscopic chemist can look at a plot which on the face of it is misleading and say, ah, yes. But if I know I've got a species with this diffusion coefficient and I know we've got one with that one, if I see a few signals in between, I can say, ah, oh, maybe the signal peaks are overlapping. Is that chemically consistent? So let's try to take an example. And so this was a trial experimental data set. It was just propanol and sucrose in water. And we really went to town on the time averaging. This has a very high signal to noise ratio. Turns out to be far higher than is actually any use, but that's what we got. And fairly standard conditions, 15 different gradient levels, equally spaced in gradient squared. So quadratic sampling, it took just under two hours. Two things that really make a difference to practical experimental dosy data are that the baseline of the um, 1D spectra that were produced is carefully corrected. And something that is very helpful is to use reference deconvolution. If you have a suitable reference signal, then effectively what this does is to correct any variation in experimental line shape that's caused during the experiment. Of course, dozy experiments, we uh, use incremented pulsed field gradients, which effectively kick the magnetic field harder and harder as we increase the diffusion, uh, sorry, increase the gradient strength. And the result is that we see more and more distortion of the signal because the magnetic field and the field frequency lock don't quite recover. Reference deconvolution can, properly used, take out this effect and it'll give us much better data. So our problem here, of course, is that we've got a bit of overlap between the terminal CH2OH of propanol and some of the sucrose signals. So if we do a standard, inverted commas, dozy experiment, what sometimes called HR dozy, high resolution dozy, this is the method that gives us the best diffusion resolution, but it completely falls over when we have signals overlapping. So here, where the signals overlap, we've got some signals that appear at intermediate diffusion coefficients. We know that can't be right because there's no, there isn't any third component here. Typically, we'll look at that and say, ah, oh, yes, well, we've got some signal overlap here. No problem. It's clear what's going on. Now, with good quality data, then we can go a stage further and we can use bi exponential fitting. A rough rule of thumb is that if your diffusion coefficients don't differ by 30%, 20% on a really good day, then there's not much point in trying by exponential fitting. A second problem Brian mentioned, the field gradients that are generated in practical probes aren't completely perfect. They're not uniform. They actually vary. You get stronger gradients in some parts of the sample than others. And what that does is to distort the signal decay in just the same way as having more than one diffusion coefficient, just the same way as peak overlap. So if you do bi-exponential fitting of a standard set of data, then you will quite often see two components that look identical. Not because there are two chemical species there, but because different parts of the sample experience different gradients. And so it's important here to use correction for the non-uniformity of the field. It's actually not too difficult to do. It's built into uh, the NMRJ software, for example. So our bi-exponential fitting lets us separate the two signals. The propanol comes out very nicely. You can see we don't get quite the right diffusion coefficient here for sucrose, but it's pretty good. As I say, very demanding in terms of signal to noise ratio. Uh, now, um, Brian has talked about um, multivariate analysis. Uh, this is just uh, one example, which is um, our modification of Peter Stilb's core method, which makes an assumption of a known number of species. So sometimes you have to do repeated attempts with different numbers and says, well, if we've got that number of species, what are the spectra and what are the diffusion coefficients? And here it works very nicely. 
The snag is, of course, if you've got a complex mixture, you might have to say, oh, I think I've got about seven or eight components. At which point the algorithm says, um, sorry, blow that for a game of soldiers. I can't cope with that. Core and score typically struggle with more than three components. And only in exceptional cases will you get more than that successfully separated. But of course, in any given window of a spectrum, we may have only a few species represented. So we can take a set of data from a more complex mixture and just analyze it piecemeal and just say, well, we'll take this chunk and then that chunk and then that chunk and do a score analysis on each individual window of the spectrum. And in that way, we can recover very nice data for really quite complex mixtures. Um, I'm not quite certain why this particular mixture was, was chosen, but it, it, it came to be called the good night out mixture. I think that was in the days when illicit substances were commoner in Manchester than they are now. A final example of a multivariate method is the conjugate case. It's where we know we've only got two species, but those diffusion coefficients are really close. By exponential fitting will fail with this data set. But what we can do is to say, well, we've got just two components and we can say they're different. And so we can impose a requirement in our analysis that the spectra should be as different as possible as is consistent with a good least squares fit. We call this method the, the outscore method and it can recover some really very complicated spectra from dozy data that look very, very gnarly with horrendous overlap and really quite similar diffusion coefficients. So that, if you like, is the council of despair. It says, well, if these are the data and we just have to make the best fist of it we can, that's what we do. The next question is, what can we do to get around this problem? How can we avoid signal overlap? Well, signal overlap has been a problem since the very earliest days of NMR. And nowadays we know what to do if we've got a spectrum that's too complicated to analyze in 1D, we do it in 2D. So the obvious extension is to go from a two-dimensional dozy experiment to a three-dimensional. So instead of measuring 1D spectra as a function of gradient strength, we'll measure 2D. I think the first one uh, that we did was uh, just to add a bipolar stimulated echo weighting to the front end of an HMQC experiment. And for uh, a simple mixture, quinine, geraniol, camphene, uh, we can display the results in the form of uh, a 3D display, or we usually find it's more useful just to take cross-sections, planes through the full 3D volume and look at the 2D HMQC spectra for different ranges of diffusion coefficient. And so leaving out the, the reference material here, these are just the projections over these three ranges of diffusion coefficient. This is our projection onto the 1D diffusion axis. Note the way this emphasizes the statistical nature of our interpretation of dozy data. We don't get a single peak where we know there should be a single peak. We get a distribution of peaks, of overlapping peaks here. And that's a reflection partly of statistical uncertainty and partly of the limitations of the instrument that we use. But still here, we get a beautiful separation of our full HMQC spectrum into the three components for the individual species. And we can play the same game with other 2D experiments. I, I like this one, which is the 2DJ IDOSI experiment, because it's so economical. It's actually just a standard pulsed field gradient 2D J spectroscopy, J resolved spectroscopy experiment. And all we do is we vary the amplitudes of the gradient pulses here. So we're using them not only to enforce our coherence transfer pathway, but also to provide diffusion weighting. It's a blisteringly fast experiment because we only need one transient per increment. Um, oh, th this example comes 
from when I had a three month visit from uh, a young postdoc from a group in Aveiro, um, Matthias Nielsen, and he very kindly brought some um, bottles of port with him for us to analyze, Aveiro being uh, Portugal, home of the port industry. Very complicated spectra. Of course, there's a lot of water and a lot of ethanol there, but if we pre-saturate that, then we can see that there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff going on here. I should say that um, uh, after three months doing NMR and doing DOZI, Matthias decided that uh, he'd found something that was more interesting in chem than chemometrics. And he uh, very quickly came back and has been with us almost ever since. So clearly this is a very, very complex mixture, um, full of sugars, not surprisingly, DOZI, uh, sorry, port being very sweet wine. But let's just focus on this bit here because that's what gives you the hangover. So if we look up in the aliphatic region here, we're just going to focus in in a 3D, 2D JI DOZI experiment and look at the J-resolved spectra for different diffusion coefficient ranges. And you can see we beautifully separate out the um, three carbon, four carbon, and five carbon chain alcohols here. Sobering to think that that's what you're drinking when you have a port. Since then, a whole variety of 3D methods have been produced. This is just another example of a heteronuclear correlation where we're effectively separating the HSQC spectra of two different components, rutin and quercetin. This is actually a constant time variant of um, HSQC. So it's another idosy. We use I here to indicate that the diffusion encoding is internal to the pulse sequence. So it effectively comes in for free. It doesn't cost us extra complication or time in the pulse sequence. And so we get a nice separation here again. Now, one of the reasons why we, we like DOZI is paradoxically because it led us into a completely different area of NMR methods, which is that in order to avoid overlap. Since we're normally using proton NMR, it makes sense to go back to perhaps the classic problem in proton NMR, which is first enunciated by Hans Primas and Richard Ernst, which is the problem of multiplet structure. The proton is a wonderful nucleus. It has a high gamma, has 100% abundant, but it's only on average got one electron around it. So it's got a very narrow chemical shift range. So spectra very rapidly get overcrowded. And when we were banging up against this resolution overlap problem in DOSI, I remembered that Heinz Stärk had told me about a beautiful experiment in which he did what Ernst had tried to do many years before, which is to collapse homonuclear multiple structure. And we went back to this experiment. Uh, the original method was called the zanger stärk experiment. Klaus Zanger, who's still in the area, and Heinz, who's now retired. And we said, well, let's just bolt a zanger stärk pure shift, as we now call it, experiment onto a diffusion-weighted stimulated echo. And instead of complicated overlapping multiplets, we should now have singlets. And sure enough, we get beautiful resolution in the diffusion domain where previously we'd had intermediate values of D because of the overlap. And that actually led us into um, a whole lot of work in pure shift NMR, which we don't have time to go into here. But just to show uh, one example of a more recent experiment, which is where we built diffusion encoding internally into a psyche pure shift experiment. And this goes back to one of our standard test samples, quinine, geraniol, and camphene. And here is the normal dozy spectrum from the normal spectrum, where we've got significant overlap between multiplets, and we see a lot of peaks at intermediate diffusion coefficients. If we collapse all the homonuclear multiplet structure, 
then we remove the overlap and now very nice pin sharp peaks here that completely separate the proton signals of our three individual components. I've only scratched the surface here. There's a, a great deal more that, that could be said about um, methodological developments in DOSI. There's still a, a good deal left to be done. And uh, there are still um, interesting questions to be asked, as Brian said, about, about sampling strategy, and in particular about how much signal to noise we actually need to get decent dozy results. Is there a simple relationship between the signal to noise ratio of the experimental data and the uncertainty in the diffusion domain in dozy spectrum? It turns out that there is that something we, we might want to come back to in the chat. But uh, I'm just at the end of my time here, so I should just finish by thanking some of the many people who've been involved in these uh, developments over the years, uh, and in particular, uh, that postdoc who visited me uh, quite a long time ago now to look at port wine and uh, never really left. So thanks very much. And Brian, I should pass back to you to take things on. Um, I think we'll just uh, pass it on to Jurgen at this point. Uh, he's going to look at um, diffusion at the lower field, but very useful benchtop systems. Thank you, Frank, for, for the introduction. And yeah, it's great to, to have heard both of you and Gareth talking about all this diffusion stuff. And this will probably a lot of uh, things I would talk about. Um, um, there are things that uh, Brian and Gareth has discussed before, but I would probably try to put this in a perspective on how this can be applied on benchtop NMR systems. But before starting with the benchtop NMR part, I will probably um, want to have a few minutes on discussing um, about the evolution of benchtop NMR spectroscopy roughly in the last 10 years. As I think probably most of you are more coming from the high field side and not everyone knows um, how these benchtop systems have evolved in the past couple of years. So basically from, let's say the side, uh, from the other side here, we had been looked, uh, we started with the idea of how small can we build a magnet where we can still fit in a five millimeter tube and get chemical shift resolution. And you see here on the picture on the left, that is what this guys at the Bernard Plumis lab where, where part of Macrotech is originating from, came up with. And we had this very small magnet put in a five millimeter tube and we got some early spectrum with water where the line width that we had here was quite broad and got totally in and we were quite um, happy that we, that we could resolve aromatics and the methyl group. So, from this time on, we said, okay, this can be probably become better. And there was a certain evolution then. So two years later, um, there was the first benchtop NMR spectroscopy system running on one Tesla. There was a very similar story in terms of getting to a higher field that, that what, what happened in high field, just an order of magnitude lower. And in parallel, there was as well um, development of different parts, accessories like online reaction monitoring, mold, uh, multi-nuclear capabilities, the possibility to do solvent suppression, all the samples, and, and all the things that are as well familiar on high field systems. 2015, we introduced as well the possibility to do diffusion measurement, and this is where I'm going to focus in, a, in a, a one or two minutes on. So if you look at current state of the art benchtop NMR systems, you will, uh, I show here a spectrum of 20% chloroform and acetone, and you see the resolution that you can get here is at 50% is something like 0.1 Hertz, at 0.55%, something like four Hertz. And even if you go uh, at 0.11%, you get something like below 10 Hertz. And this is probably in, in Hertz, yeah, something similar that you would as well expect on a, on a, on a proper efficient high field system. Obviously this is in Hertz and not in PPM, but still having this performance now and this resolution, which as well helps to, to uh, um, to improve sensitivity, you can start running some standard 
um, uh, spectra, like here the 1D proton run on a 90 megahertz system. And you can uh, concentration like 250 millimolar single shot, you get quite nice resolved peaks. Obviously, here in the aliphatic region, there is some signal overlap. But then you have as well the chance to run carbons, where you can uh, basically nicely get one to one spectra from what you get in high field. Basically, what we need is a longer measurement time. So in this case, it's taking two hours. You can run 2D cozy experiments as well. So this on the same sample takes about 30 minutes, and you can very nicely resolve all the couplings that you, that you have there. On top of that, you can as well run this HSPC or HMBC methods that Gareth was mentioning. So this, in this case is not combined with the dozy axis, but still in quite short times now making use of the uh, polarization transfer to the protons, you can get quite nice HSPC spectra in about 10 minutes. And if you're applying some non uniform sampling, this can be even come faster. And well, on the right side here, you see an HMBC well, quite in half an hour. And what, what we think is like this methods will overcome some of the uh, disadvantages that you have because of the lower chemical shift spreading. So now having all these methods in place for, um, for the standard NMR, now let's have a look on what can we do with uh, diffusion. So I have a few points I would like to discuss here. And the first one will be quite short is about how we measure diffusion with a bench of NMR system. And the answer is pretty much exactly the same as what we do in high field. And then you can apply this to the different applications. And we've heard about the diffusion order spectroscopy before from Gareth. And we will look at an example of molecular weight of biopolymers. And this is what Brian has mentioned. Then I think we have a quite interesting case here where we can look at multi, a multinuclear self diffusion, uh, diffusion study. So this is used for the study of uh, lithium ion battery electrolytes. And as a last example, I've taken um, some uh, measurements or some, some plots from a paper from one of our customers, which showcase nicely how NMR uh, or the battery systems can be directly brought to a process and where you have the chance to measure automatically for your, in a fully automatic way um, diffusion coefficients that in this case are used for droplet sizing. So this, I guess we've all already seen. It's a, it's a stimulated echo sequence. Um, that is uh, that we typically apply here. We've got the state scale tenor equations. I don't have to say much about this. Um, we can fit those data that we get and extract from the from the slope of this uh, of this fit. We can extract the diffusion coefficients. So typically, all the bench of systems that we would come would already come with like a three D set of gradients for coherent selections. But for diffusion, you will typically need stronger gradients to be able as well to measure samples that have a low diffusion coefficient. So we typically have like rates that can go up to one Tesla per meter, depending on the model that we use. One thing that we try to keep in mind when um, looking, doing NMR with benchtop systems is that the users of the benchtop NMR systems are typically not the NMR experts that are doing their whole life NMR, but often these instruments are sitting in a normal chemistry lab or in a lab that, uh, where you have a chemist that is not a dedicated NMR expert or you have lab technicians or even engineers um, who, are, who are running those types of, uh, of um, experiments. And what we try is to minimize the set of parameters that you have to adjust, which in many cases can become overwhelming for the non-NMI experts. So we try to reduce, for example, the, the parameters just to the ones that will be sample dependent and have like piles length and uh, delays, have, have uh, other delays have those fixed. And we have uh, tried to give a simple way of um, analyzing the data. So in this case, we'll just put an integral. Integral, it will do um, a single component fit and will spit out your um, diffusion coefficients. So, and this way you have like an easy data processing that would help you to as well attract people that are probably not um, well familiar too much with the MR site. So here's one example now. Um, of, a, of a small molecule mixture. In this case, we have procaine and paracetamol. And here's um, a similar situation as Gareth was explaining. So there are regions that are um, uh, where there's no signal overlap in the mixture, but you have the well regions here, particularly in the aromatics, where you will have some overlap. So one way just to measure the fluid coefficient of this mixture is just to say, okay, I will just sit on the peaks that I know are separated 
and you put them in a, in a stage flat tenor plot, and you see here, even um, you have just a quite a small variation of the diffusion coefficient of the two components. So in this case, it's between around 15%. You can nicely differentiate those and determine the, um, the diffusion coefficients. So if you look at a dozy plot, yeah, in some cases, you, you are lucky, let's say, or, uh, and you have even in the small variations, you can get, uh, you have a chance to, to differentiate uh, the different mixtures here. And even, even in this case, the diffusion coefficients are quite close to each other. You see nicely the two lines for the two different spectra. And obviously here, so, uh, we used water solvent and the diffusion coefficient of the water will be much, uh, will be much higher. So this data was well processed with the, with the toolbox um, from uh, which you can download from Charles Morris group server. This uh, was still the Dozy toolbox, and I've just seen that I think there's a newer version which, which includes more functions that probably need to update ourselves. So again, now looking at larger molecules, and this is uh, a quite similar case in what Brian was. Um, uh, discussing and actually we haven't talked about it before what we're going to show but here's exactly the idea so we have here a plot called polymer of polystyrene and polymer methyl mesic relate and if you just want to measure what's the monomer ratio in there you can see okay just by integrating the different regions here in the aromatics you will get the styrene, the styrene signal and you've got here the methyl group from the pmma you will be able to determine what is the ratio between those two but what you cannot say if these are Copolymers or homopolymers just by having a 1D spectrum. So here, if you look at the copolymer, you what you get is like basically the same diffusion coefficient, yeah, for the for the methyl group as well for the styrene group. Um, but if you would now have a polymer blend, you would be able to differentiate between the two if they have some, some of different molecular weight size. Although the um, the proton spectrum. Will look, the, will look the same. So here you have the chance to use DOSI to differentiate if it's a copolymer or if it's two homopolymers. And even now, if you add, let's say, a homo, homopolymer to the, co, to the copolymer, you have a situation that you have the same diffusion coefficients for the molecules that belong to the copolymer. But then you have as well the chance, if you do this by way of financial fitting, that you will see here a differentiation of the diffusion coefficient of the homopolymer. Uh, with the part that belongs to the copolymer. Now, as we've seen, that the uh, molecular weight or the fuel coefficient depends on the molecular weight. Yeah? We can as well apply this um, to give an estimate on the mo molecular weight of different polymers. So this, in this case, here we were looking together with, uh, with Jack Reynolds on different uh, samples of lignin. So he, he's got a 400 megahertz system and we just run the two spectra. So this is on a 43 megahertz system. So um, this is, a, let's say the lowest field that we have been offering with the benchmark systems. And you see the spectra well, resemble each other, but obviously on, on, still on 400 megahertz, you will have um, a, a bit more structured area here, particularly in the aliphatics. But if you look at the diffusion coefficient of those two samples, they are very good agreement with each other. And then you can um, plot this against molecular weight determined through a, a GPC analysis, and you can have like a, a good estimate of calibration to measure molecular weights as well using a benchtop system. So moving away from the polymers, I would like now to look at a, at a, a case study where I've been looking at transport properties in uh, lithium ion electrolytes. So they often um, have as well what's called an ionic liquid in there. In this case, it's, a, it's this BMMBF4, which is a room temperature ionic liquid. And then you have different species now in this electrolyte solution. So you have this ionic liquid cation. In this case, you have BF4 minus as an anion, and you have the lithium for, for the transport as a cation. So now with those uh, with this benchtop system, now we can fully automatically measure those different nuclei and look at the transport or the, uh, or the molecular mobility of each of those due to, uh, via diffusion measurements. So we've got here the proton spectrum from the cation, the fluorine spectrum 
which is nice about fluid very simple, just a single peak, which is perfect for this diffusion evaluation, as well as the lifting. So now looking at the data, again, you are using a stimulated echo sequence here. You can see the attenuation with the gradient strength of the protons, of the fluorine and the lithium. And then if you want to understand what is now, for example, the impact of the concentration of the lithium ion on the, on the molecular diffusion, you would just run a series of measurement with different lithium um, uh, ion concentration. And you, for example, see here on the top left, you see the measurements run uh, on the uh, cation, uh, cation. And then you see here in red is the uh, uh, diffusion curve of the need sample. And as soon as you increase the lithium concentration, you see how the slope gets, gets smaller. This means the diffusion coefficients gets, uh, get smaller as well. And you see very much the same behavior for all the ions that you have in the mixture. And in the concentration range that we're looking at, this behaves quite, quite linear. So if we increase the lithium concentration, as you see here, we got a decrease in the diffusion coefficients. And interestingly, the lithium, although being a quite small ion, it always shows a lower diffusion coefficient, coefficient than the other ones. Yeah, so we can here look at the dependence of, um, of, of the molecular mobility or transport properties with, with multi-nuclear NMR on a benchtop system to understand what are the impacts of the different variations that you can do have in the electrolyte. And you can obviously do this not only for concentration, but you can as well look at different cation species and you see here as well, although you have quite uh, two similar sized cations, so one is a, a metazolium and a pyrolidinium cation, you can see about a factor of two difference in the, um, in the diffusion coefficient. And again, the diffusion coefficient of the lithium ion is still always the smallest here in, uh, in this mixture. So you can now use this benchtop systems where you have the chance to run several nuclei in a fully automated way means that you just switch in the software you don't, don't, don't need to do any retuning when you switch between the different nuclei and for example you can as well add phosphorus if you want so as, as some of the uh, ionic liquids as well will contain phosphorus in the anion and you have a very simple way of running those measurements and as the last example i would want to look at a, um, at a work that has been done in the group of Michael uh, of Mike Johns at the University of Western Australia. And he is looking, um, in this case, on crude oil. So the crude oil, when it's produced, it often comes as a water and oil emulsion. And obviously, the water is, is undesired, and they want to get rid of this. And, how, and typically, how to get the way to get rid of this is to destabilize the um, uh, the emulsion, so they have a separate, separated phase. And the stability of this emulsion will depend on the droplet size. So typically, the larger the droplet size becomes, the more unstable will become the emulsion. And NMR can, as well there, uh, give a way to measure this droplet size via diffusion. So I don't want to go too much into detail in all the mathematics here, because it can become quite complicated. But I just want to give the idea on how, um, yes, how diffusion can be used to measure the size of droplets. So we've seen similar pictures of this, like, of this before for, for the random walk. And if you have like a, a free diffusing molecule, it will do what, what, what was discussed before. You will have like a, the mean square displacement will be proportional to um, the diffusion coefficient. Now what happens if you put your molecule inside a drop so that you have a boundary? Yeah? Your molecule will as well do a random walk, but it cannot walk as far as it would could if it was free. So what you will get is that your, your average mean square displacement will be smaller than in the case of free diffusion. So as well, you will get a diffusion coefficient or an apparent diffusion coefficient that will be smaller than the one of, uh, of a free diffusion. And obviously, if you have smaller drops, your apparent diffusion coefficient will as well become smaller. So in this way now, you will get like, if you measure this, this emulsions, a distribution of, of many diffusion coefficients or apparent diffusion coefficients. And there are people who have um, um, in invented clever ways on um, how to um, get now this um, droplet size distributions 
from this curve and they apply some data processing and they get this distributions. So in this case, now they were looking at different emulsions and they were fitting this data and they were getting different droplet size distributions. This type of droplet sizing is actually something that has been quite known for quite a long time and is applied typically on time domain NMR systems, for example, for characterizing foodstuff. One advantage that, that you bring in here, if you have a chemical shift resolution is that you're not, that, that you do not need to rely on relaxation filters. So instead of having to hope that the uh, your continuous phase will only have a single uh, relaxation time to filter properly out, you just have the chance here now to sit on, for example, the oil phase or the water phase and use the signal for the um, droplet side distribution measurements. So in this case, they looked at the different emulsions and they had different distributions and they saw that this emulsion A was the one that had been the most stable one. And now thought, okay, now how can we look, what's the best way now how to destabilize this uh, emulsion? So what they did is like, they built a setup that is shown here on, on the left, where they had a container, um, where they put in the emulsion and they con uh, continued mixing by pumping it through, uh, through a loop here on high velocity. And then after different times, they were just opening a valve here and they was, were feeding the liquid through um, a second a loop in which in, in th inside this loop was a bench turbine mass system. So if you look at this magnet, this was actually um, a very, the very first version of the, of the spin solve or the system that we've been building and um, it still didn't have a housing, but, uh, but, but they will be, will be able to make it use. And this one has like a, a gradient of one to up to one Tesla per minute. And you would have like in a stop flow mode, so we're pumping this in, stopping the flow and then running the diffusion measurements uh, in this one. So they were looking at different demulsifiers and if you can look, uh, if you look here for the demultifier two and three, there were hardly any change uh, with the time um, of the, the droplet side distribution. But if you look here at demultifier one, you see here how the, uh, how the droplet size changes as a function of time going to higher droplet sizes. And this tells you about the way how it the progresses of your destabilization process. And then you can as well look on what is the best concentration that you need. And they were checking different concentrations. You could see here 0.5%, 0.75% 5 was not enough to destabilize the uh, emulsion. But if they went to 1%, you could nicely see now as how with the time, the uh, mean droplet size in, uh, increases. And this would show you that your uh, liquid is destabilized. So in this case, they were able to use this and bring the bench of NMR really close to the experimental setup. And this is where we see as well one strength of the systems because they are quite small and compact to bring them directly to the reaction, for example, or directly to the place where you want to measure. With this now, I want to conclude uh, my presentation and just saying so that, that there has been a quite a big development in bench of NMR systems over the past 10 years. The bench of NMR systems can be equipped with strong pulse field gradients for diffusion measurements. The typical methods that are applied are very similar to what's used as well in high field. And the small size and ease of use of the system does allow to implement benchtop NMR spectroscopy for applications like byline or online monitoring that are probably otherwise quite difficult to access. And thank you with this. And I would like to give back to go back to Brian. OK. Um, first, I want to thank. Uh, Gareth and, and Jurgen for uh, participating in this with, with, with me. I um, really appreciate their efforts and contributions. Um, I think right now what, what we can do is dive right into the Q&A. Um, we have a question already on the chat and I think um, I'm going to just answer that one, but I think after that, uh, we can allow people either to um, unmute and ask a question directly or uh, go ahead and, and enter a question in the, in the chat. So um, the first question was on polymer diffusion, how large 
uh, of a polymer, can you measure with a normal probe, not a Brooker diffusion probe, uh, and what concentration satisfies dilute conditions? Well, um, I'm typically working with a probe that delivers 100 gauss per centimeter. Um, I think in the, in the early indirect PFG probes, they delivered something like 30 gauss per centimeter. I did a lot of work with 30 gauss per centimeter. Um, you can measure polymers um, up to 100,000 molecular weight, I would say. Um, 100 gauss per centimeter, you can pretty well access almost any polymer up to, you know, almost up to a million molecular weight. Uh, it just depends on um, how your probe performs and every probe is gonna be different. Um, so I, you know, certainly a probe that's not diffusion designed can, can easily get up to 100, 200,000, but it depends. Um, in dilute conditions, I would say polymers up to 20,000 molecular weight, you can get away with one milligram per mil. So that's about 0.1%. Um, and half that you can get up to um, half a million or million molecular weight. Um, you might have to do a couple of experiments and verify that you're getting the same diffusion coefficient. Um, and if you do, then you're in the dilute regime. Um, so I think that that covers, I don't know if you have anything else to add, Gareth, on, on that. Every probe is different. Yes, I, I would say a, a lot also depends on the relaxation times. So if you have a polymer which has, for example, uh, it is deca it's pegylated. So if you um, got dangling chains which have relatively rapid motion. You can have quite long relaxation times then. And that means that you can access a higher range of molecular weights. If on the other hand, you've got a rather rigid polymer with short T2s, then you're more constrained. So the, the upper limit really depends a lot on the nature of the polymer involved. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> Um, okay, I, I've, got a, I've got a question um, uh, for you, Gareth. You mentioned that there's a lot to do. Um, so where, where do you see the future directions in, in improving our experimentation with diffusion? But if, if I knew the next earth shattering experiment, I certainly wouldn't be telling you here. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we, I, I think between us, we've really pinned down many of the big challenges. So the, the first is resolution, resolution, resolution. How can we get better separation of signals so that we can get around this fundamental tragedy of Dozy that we're trying to do a statistical reconstruction? That we're very much model based. Next, is there anything more that we can do to get more out of our existing data. And we've all of us seen the spectacular developments in the application of artificial intelligence in, for example, protein structure. Well, this is a, a much less um, dramatic application, but I'm sure there are things that we can do. AI is very good at imposing models on experimental data. You can imagine taking a dozy data, taking a diffusion NMR data set and saying, well, let me try different ways of interpreting this. Let me try a mono exponential analysis, bi exponential analysis, score with different numbers of components. AI, um, suppose we, we, we say, well, we have a smooth distribution. In the past, we would have used variants on the inverse Laplace transform, but maybe there are interesting things to be done with that. And then equipment, we, we, we 
we tend to take our um, probe designs as a given. We, we just have to work with what the manufacturer gives us. But what the manufacturer gives us is really very variable. I mean, we've both of us mentioned a little bit about correction for non-uniform gradients. Just to emphasize, the effect of having a non-uniform field gradient is physically indistinguishable in the data from the effect of having more than one component. And so if we want to be able to look at, for example, molecular weight distributions, then we need either to avoid any non-uniformity of the field gradient or to have ways of correcting it. So I think that there's, there is scope still for improvements in instrument design, which give us more uniform and more agile gradients. We need to be able to turn our field gradients off and on and have them turn on straight away and have them turn off fully off reasonably quickly. I actually wanted to ask Jürgen a question, which was um, about the challenges of doing diffusion NMR experiments with pulsed field gradients when we have permanent or electromagnets, when we have what we, what we would used to call iron cord magnets. Does that limit the um, switch on and switch off times? Does that limit recovery times from the application of a field gradient pulse? I, I, I think the, the, the gradient um, uh, rise times that, that we have are probably similar, to, I would guess, to what we have high field. I'm, to, to be honest, I'm, I'm not the, the probe engineer. Yeah, but I think um, uh, ramp times and uh, stabilization times would be quite similar to, to what we as well see on high field. Yeah. What's the gradient uniformity? Uh, have you done um, like the uh, profile testing to look at how how it varies, how the, the yeah, I don't, varies yeah. in resistance? Yeah, I, I I don't I don't have the plots here, but but obviously yes, we have been looking on, on gradient uniformity. So I, I think the um, the RF coils are probably not not as large as you would have on a high field. And so the chances as well to to have like a, a gradient coils um, uh, uh, quite homogeneous over the region that we use is uh, this works quite well. I have a I have a question um, to the panel. Um, well, I am. As a preface, I am a newcomer to this um, data analysis itself, to be honest. Um, but has that been, there are lots of new tools, not new, some old um, tools to resolve this overlapping areas. Uh, I'm not taking you into my passion. I'm just asking generally, uh, examples are global spectral deconvolution, in frequency domain, uh, Bayesian, which was like 20, 30 years ago, published by Larry um, in time domain. Have those been explored? Has that been just, is there a specific reason why, if not, is there a specific reason why they don't work in this scenario? It's, it's purely how do we resolve overlapping areas, overlapping peaks? That seems to be the problem that I'm hearing, at least from Garrett's and Ergen's and Brian's talk. Yeah, I think um, resolving overlap peaks is, is pretty easy as long as the diffusion coefficients are far enough apart, but it's when the diffusion coefficients are close to one another that's when it becomes exceedingly difficult to deal with overlap. Um, I don't have experience with Bayesian and some of these other techniques. I'm not sure if Gareth um, can, can comment on that. Um, there's techniques, for example, that just look at the time domain, you know, maybe, maybe there's opportunity there. To answer Chris's Basic question, no, I don't, as far as I know, people really haven't used frequency domain fitting methods to pre-process dozy data. And it, it, it's certainly, there's certainly a possibility that it, it would be useful. I, I would say that it's a particularly challenging case because you need to produce quantitative results. You need to 
um, produce very accurate results if they're to be useful in diffusion analysis. And I would certainly want to do this bearing in mind the variation of the experimental line shape with the field gradient pulse amplitude. So a simple um, craft style fitting probably isn't going to give very good data because you've got this problem of the, the line shape changing. But with, coupled with reference deconvolution or an equivalent tool, yes, it, it, it yeah. could, well be, could well be useful. When I was talking about our assumptions and about the way that we apply models in our analysis, this is a, this is a good example. We could imagine doing an analysis in which we assume that all our lines are well-behaved Lorentzians. If that's the case, then what is the best reconstruction of a 2D diffusion spectrum, a 2D dosy spectrum from these experimental data? And uh, yes, that would be a very interesting thing to try. Yeah, I, I, I certainly think uh, reference deconvolution as a pre-processing to either frequency or time domain based deconvolution followed by fitting to diffusion uh, would be a very interesting uh, flow of data. If, if you were going to do a peak fit, then you could avoid needing time domain processing altogether. And you could actually have a reference material in your sample with a known sharp line shape. And then you would simply say for each gradient level, that is the experimental line shape convoluted with the true line shape of that. So you could simply fit the rest of your spectrum with replicas of that reference line shape. If you're already going to be doing frequency domain fitting, then that, that's fine. The, 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 the catch is you have to have a reference signal which is clean, sharp, and has very slow diffusion. And that's the challenge. It's finding a reference material that doesn't diffuse under the conditions of the experiment. There, there are fancy pulse sequences you could, you could try that cheat, that don't apply the diffusion weighting to the reference, but they do apply it to the signals of interest. But there's a challenge there. Um, if I could, Brian, can I just duck on to a question that appeared in the chat? Because yeah. it's relevant here. Yeah, good. So uh, Robert Tansy, you're asking, can the addition of a standard help account for the gradient variation and correction? Well, we've talked here about using the standard, using the peak shape of the standard to correct for the systematic errors caused by line shape changes. But the question of correcting for the gradient variation is an interesting one. The answer is that if you had a very high signal to noise ratio reference signal live in the sample, Yes, you could in principle use that. You'd say, right, I know that this is monodisperse. So any deviation from the statistical tenor equation comes from the non-uniformity of the field gradient. And you could take that signal, extract it, fit it and say, hmm, okay, well, that is the actual shape of the statistical tenor decay rather than the exponential that it says in, in the literature. But that's a pretty, big ask, having a really high signal to noise ratio, clean monodisperse reference. And so what we would normally do is just to do a separate experiment because we don't need an internal reference. And so normally we simply do a single calibration for uh, a given probe and um, experimental parameters. Typically we'll use something like 1% uh, H2O in, H in D2O because we've got a very accurate diffusion coefficient for that. And we would do the calibration that way with an external reference. But an internal reference is certainly possible. So thanks for the question. I think um, I was kind of, you know, I've had some experiences with the various uh, dozy, the, vari the, the variations of the dozy method. And it occurs to me, why not use the loco dozy every time? Um, in, in my hands, it doesn't always work, but but why? I mean, it, it seems in principle that ought to be the go-to every single time. Um, but what, what are some of the details, Gareth, that might 
make that not so. <laughs> okay. Um, I think my, my, my general rule is that I'm never satisfied with just one sophisticated analysis method because only by trying multiple methods can I be reasonably confident that I understand what's going on. So always I would do a simple mono-exponential fit in HR dosage spectrum first, and then I'd say, mm, okay, so we've got some overlap here, there, and so on. loco dosy works very well if you get the segmentation right, and if you have only a small number of components in each window. Okay. The difficulty is that as soon as you have extra components creeping in there, if you turn out, you, maybe you've got a solvent signal under, this, under a signal of interest, something like that, then you're in real trouble and you'll get misleading results. And the rest of it will look so pretty that you'll be seduced. <laughs> so I'm a cynic here. I, I always want, want to look at the raw data. I want to, want to see what's, what's going on. And let me be undiplomatic here. There are some sophisticated processing methods out there in packages that I won't name that give the most horrendously misleading simple results. And a significant proportion of the dozy papers in the literature are plain damn wrong, alas. So just, just a warning. In particular, if your favored processing program is a black box, and doesn't tell you what it's doing, be very, very suspicious of the outputs. It's very easy to overinterpret dozy data. I agree. Yep. That's what makes uh, the, the NAT such a nice uh, package to work with. It has it, it, it all there. But you can, you can look at a lot of different methods. I, I yep. should say that the, the, the NAT is just the lineal descendant of the dozy toolbox. So the dozy toolbox was regenerated into the NAT because it, the scope just widened beyond dozy. That's right. Um, I, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, convection currents caused by temperature gradients. I was going to ask Jurgen, um, how do the benchtop systems fare with temperature gradients? In other words, with, with uh, traditional spectrometers, the um, VT air typically comes in from the bottom and heats the bottom of the tube, and you end up with temperature variation across the tube, and that can cause convection currents, especially in chloroform and some other low viscous solvents. Um, Oh, how do the benchtop systems heat the sample? Do they have VT? I think they have VT. No, so typically, so VT is actually is, is, an, uh, is a kind of problem for benchtop system. So obviously what we try is to keep the magnets as small as possible. And this means that the bore that you've got in there is, is quite, it's becomes quite small. Yeah? And what you try to, um, to have is, let's say that, um, um, because the permanent magnets usually have a certain sensitivity to temperature. Yeah, you, you try to, to avoid too strong temperature changes. So what we have now in, in our systems is like the magnet itself is working at something like 20, 26, 27 degrees. Yeah, and the sample will take up the, the temperature of the magnet in a certain way. So in this case, because the, the temperature of the magnet is very homogeneous, you will not have the similar issues as you would have with the blowing air from the bottom, yeah? because the, the samples will, itself, we will get a very um, stable temperature over, over the whole range. Obviously, if you would have a sample, I think that, that would go out, that, that you would fill it so high that you would have it reaching out of the magnet, because the magnets are quite small. This, um, I could see that there could be a temperature gradient, yeah? but typically you, you will have your, your samples filled, I don't know, Half a, half a milliliter, something like that. Yeah, and in this case, we have a quite uh, homogeneous temperature throughout the sample. Okay. Um, and is there a, a convection compensated one shot experiment out there? I believe yes. Um, it, it's not one that uh, that we we produce, but 
uh, I think possibly Peter Shandor produced one. Um, the, the difficulty is that that is really getting pretty long and complicated. So you lose a lot of signal from relaxation uh, or? Well, um, no, it, it's more that you've got multiple opportunities for um, the wrong components to refocus, I guess. Actually, no, that's, that, that's, not, that's not too much of a, not too much of a problem. Um, yes, I, I would have, I would have thought the commonest experiment in, in current use is a um, convection compensated BPSTE, and there's no reason why you couldn't apply the, the one-shot logic to that and unbalance the, those gradient, um, those gradient pulses there. All right, well, if you try that, let me know. <laughs> um, I get around uh, some of the problem of, of um, convection by simply spinning the sample. Um, that actually helps. Uh, I guess a lot of people are using now thick-walled sample tubes. Do you have experience with that? Yes, the, um, we, we've, we've written a few papers on this um, ab about the magnitudes of convection currents and so on generally. And the, the thing that really helps is that the um, onset of rayleigh benard convection and the velocity of Hadley convection depend on something like the inverse fourth power of the, so it depends on the fourth power of the radius. And so if you halve the ID of your tube, then your convection problem just get a whole lot less bad. So um, if you're desperate for signal to noise ratio, then you can try spinning, but the difficulty is that any transverse variation of the field gradient is really going to mess things up when you try to apply strong diffusion weighting. So I would normally go for, um, yes, a thick wall tube, or even, even maybe just a three mil tube put into a five mil turbine. Yep. And that works very nicely. Yep. Uh, if, if you're feeling uh, extravagant, um, sapphire tubes are very nice. They're relatively thick wall and they've got a much higher thermal conductivity. Right, okay. I was, uh, I was thinking different, different glass materials, yeah. Yeah, the glasses don't, don't, make, don't make too much, too much difference. Um, I, I did have a question that was put directly to me in the chat. Should I turn to that next? Yeah, yep, yep. Um, sure. So, um, uh, uh, Nitin Karachaya, um, can we measure the diffusion for uh, an IDP where amide proton signals are overlapped and you have limited sample concentration? That's a, that's a challenge. Um, if obviously, if you've got a single IDP present, then the fact that you've got signal overlap isn't a problem. Overlap is only a problem where peaks overlap that come from species with different diffusion coefficients. So if you simply want to measure the diffusion coefficient in IDP, IDP that's fine, just, just bang ahead. But be very, very wary of looking at NHs because they exchange. And if you've got exchange with the water, you'll see that your NHs say, I've got a diffusion coefficient of um, 10 to the minus, uh, five times 10 to the minus 10 meters squared per second. But your methyls and the rest of the spectrum will say, no, no, I'm more like 10 to the minus 11 meters squared per second. So NH is generally in IDPs because they're solvent exposed, obviously, and exchange so easily are not safe for measuring um, diffusion coefficients. They are very nice for measuring uh, NH exchange rates by diffusion, but I would I would use the um, main protein backbone envelope. If you've got more than one IDP, then that's really much more challenging. If I knew I had two IDPs, I would probably end up using something like SCORE. I think. I don't know what you feel, Brian. Yeah, I think. Um... I think a score is such a a useful uh, method. I, I think is 
as long as we should mention too that as long as you have a wide um, or, or a, a strong decay in signal, then then score will will be very good. In other words, you you want the signal to go almost down to nothing by the time you're done with the experiment. Then then it, it the algorithm has a, a broader range in, in signal difference to um, to, to use. So I think if if there's a lot of overlap, that that's where you want to go. Brian, there are three other questions in the chat um, related to one protein protein interaction, another one XY gradients, the third yeah. one on HRMAS. Yep, I see that. Um, I, I don't have a lot of experience with proteins. I, I think if you know the protein quite well, you know, you've got it, um, if you have it well assigned, uh, certainly you can just find uh, an area that's not so overlapped. Um, but again, using SCORE um, or DECRA as a means to differentiate diffusion coefficients, um, that might be the way to go. But again, I, I think, um, as I tried to mention, one of the keys in using those techniques is to get a, a strong decay in the data. So make sure that the, the data at the end of the experiment go almost down to nothing. That's my experience. Yeah, I'd, I'd be a bit worried about signal to noise ratio there. Uh, an alternative would be to um, use uh, a 3D experiment and do an HSQC dozy, something like that. And uh, there you've got much more chance of resolving individual signals. And you can also hedge your bets. You, you can look at 50 cross peaks. And if 20 of them have one diffusion coefficient, 20 have another, and the rest are somewhere in between, you can be fairly confident you know what's going on. Nice. Um, okay. Next question. Uh, oh, sorry. I, sh I should apologize to Istvan Peltcher because I've just seen that he's just sent me um, a, a chat message saying, you could try HSQC, Dozy. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds think alike, Istvan. <laughs> um, so what about X and Y gradients? Can we take advantage of them? Um, the answer is yes. Um, I've never used them. Typically, the gradients in the transverse directions are, are much weaker than the standard Helmholtz coil that you would use in the Z direction. Um, but people, there are papers out there where people use X and Y uh, gradients to measure diffusion. Um, often, they are concerned about um, anisotropic diffusion. Um, I think if you were to measure isotropic diffusion, you'd probably go with the, the Z gradient because it's typically stronger. Right? Well, th th there is one big advantage to using X and Y gradients over Z gradients, which is that, of course, your convection has much less impact. Huh? And so if you use X and Y gradients, then um, the impact of convection may be um, tenfold less, something like that. Mm -hmm. So we, we've certainly done that. Um, commercial triax gradient systems have perfectly respectable transverse gradient magnitudes now. Um, uniformity may be a bit less good. Uh, it can be very handy to have triax gradients where you're doing uh, more complicated pulse sequences because you can use one direction for diffusion encoding and then two other directions for CTP selection, coherence transfer pathway selection, without worrying about accidentally refocus things, re refocusing things in particular about, without worrying about complicating the state called Tanner equation. Because if you do something like a constant time HSQCI dozy experiment, where you have pulsed field gradients being used for two different purposes within the same sequence, they can interfere with each other and they can just complicate the analysis a little bit. So if you've got them, 
triangles gradients are really very nice. And yes, the most beautiful thing you can do with triax gradients is to um, monitor diffusion anisotropy. And that's how you can produce these wonderful images of tractigraphy in the brain, where you can see the orientation of the nerve fibers change as you move across the brain. Staggering stuff. Yeah, that's uh, it's brilliant. <laughs> um, and I think maybe I'll take one more question here um, and then we can wrap up. Does anyone have experience with diffusion in high res MAS? Uh, in fact, I do. Um, I, I did it um, a few years ago. And really the only thing that you need to be concerned about is to sync the gradient time with the actual rotation of the, um, the rotor in the system. Um, and once you do that, then the, the experiment behaves as though it were a normal experiment. At least that's in my, my experience. Um, you can get reasonable data. I don't think the gradients are typically very strong in these in these uh, probes, but maybe, you know, this is quite a few years ago. I don't know if there's been a lot of probe advance in that area, but it can be done. I think it's still quite a niche experiment, but I know that um, Ian Day in Sussex has uh, done quite a lot of work with uh, HRMAS diffusion measurements. Yeah, there's quite a few papers out there on it. Um, it's, uh, there are some, some advantages for sure. Um, so I don't know, any other thoughts or? Um, Dave, Russ, Dave Rice, who is our typical MC, is, um, um, he's um, away. Um, he was in the <laughs> airport when um, the meeting started, so I am stepping in for him. I want to thank um, the panelists today. Uh, fantastic. I learned a lot. A um, lot of interesting stuff I learned and a lot of interesting things I'm planning to try and play around, um, <laughs> which is what we want to, we want these panel discussions to um, to achieve um, uh, for us to, for all of us to go back to the lab or to our computer and, and try new stuff. Um, with that, um, I will, um, I want to thank on behalf of everyone in Ivan. John is not here at this moment and, and Dave Rice, uh, who's had to catch a flight and Dan Iverson, my partner in Ivan group and uh, Eric and I want to thank all of you to, for, for coming in today and hope to see you in the future um, Ivan meetings. And uh, there was one point somebody else raised uh, earlier about uh, availability of these um, videos in YouTube. They are available. There's a channel, YouTube channel uh, for, on MR resources. There's a link in the chat um, if you go to Ivan website, you will be able to connect from there. Typically, it takes about three or four days before it'll a, a meeting appears in the channel uh, because Eric does this magic uh, editing things that um, are not relevant for the meeting and so on and so forth. So uh, you should be able to watch all the meetings up at least up to the last 15 meetings or so uh, if you are interested. With that, I will use my uh, ordained power that Dave gave me uh, to bang the gavel and close this meeting. Thank you all for coming and we'll see you in the next meeting. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Gareth and Jurgen. Thank you, Brian. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.